What we would try and do is uh, uh, sort of give a bit of an overview of where the field is at the moment in terms of viral targets and, uh, and drug successes and then highlight uh, opportunities for different virological targets that are either yet to be in development or uh, hopefully could be in development. So these are my disclosures. So what I'll uh, do very briefly is cover the uh, current virological targets, uh, possible, highlight possible new directions, and then look at um, opportunities for integration into existing and new therapies. <clears throat> and um, I, I guess what we've learned over the years is um, you know, in, in chronic disease infections like hepatitis B, it's combination therapy will be the way to go forward if we're going to cure. And so combine or perish would be the theme. Um, we've got, and, and we're going to, the session this afternoon after I sit down will be really highlighting the successes to date. We're going to hear a little bit about viral entry, about the viral transcriptome, and about capsid assembly and disassembly, and the successes of various uh, initiatives that have gone to sort of control those particular steps. And, and I think what will sort of be the theme through the, my talk this afternoon will be how many targets are we, do we need to, be, uh, to have blocked in order to achieve cure. Um, and I think that was a very interesting debate that we had in the hepatitis C space, and I think one that we should try and have uh, today and sort of open the, open the batting this afternoon. So <clears throat> even though we're going to look at those three in particular, there are many other targets in the life cycle of the hepatitis B virus that, uh, that we're all familiar with. And the, the area that really of surprise that has been actually neglected so far is the processing and, and generation of the mini chromosome. And, uh, and I'll briefly flag that in my, in my presentation. <coughs> but really, assembly and, and the surface antigen itself, even though uh, the RNA eye work does look very promising, but there are other aspects to um, the surface antigen that need to be considered. So let's have a look at entry. Um, entry is a, really has been re, uh, re resolved quite well in the last few years. We now know that there are um, two major uh, rece receptors, a low affinity heparin sulfate proteoglycan receptor, shown for you there in blue, uh, and the uh, high affinity um, receptor, the uh, NTCP, the um, bile acid transporter. Uh, and really, the e exploitation has been effective here with the uh, invention of Mercludex, a competitive inhibitor of the interaction between NTCP and the uh, PRIUS-1. And um, I think that uh, uh, it's flagged in a discussion point earlier today that um, the important concept that's emerging is the protection of cells from multiple rounds of viral reinfection. We used to think that, um, I'm going the wrong way. We used to think that the intercellular conversion pathway which was newly synthesized um, genomic DNA in capsids being recycled back to the nucleus was a major pathway for uh, uh, generation and processing of the mini chromosome. But really, th that's probably wrong and a, and a bit of a, a simplification. What is important is mul these multiple rounds of viral reinfection. And the other important concept that's changed is what's out there in the peripheral compartment. And uh, with new technologies and the application of them too, the various forms that we see in the peripheral compartment in the blood space, we've identified not just a clonal view of uh, hepatitis B genomic DNA packaged in capsids and envelope, but really a very diverse forms of, of, of diverse varieties of hepatitis B replicative intermediates. Not only do we see wild type DNA or quasi species DNA, but we also see double stranded linear DNA, which is that uh, was discussed in the context of integration a bit earlier. We see quite frequently splice variants. We see full length and partial length RNA. So this is a very heterogeneous space, and that's my point, that uh, we need to sort of shift our uh, sort of thinking a bit away from the clonal view of a virus coming in, replicating so many progeny, assembling, and then all of those clonal babies getting out. That's, hepatitis B just does not do that. It's like a typical retrovirus in that context. And I think this was highlighted to me with some work from the Gilead group a couple of years ago from uh, Rudy Barron's uh, area, where he showed that the hepatitis B xRNA was an intimate part of the virion of HPV. So hence the sort of urban concept of multiple rounds of reinfection are important. You can see that the hepatitis B virus is probably bringing in the hepatitis B X transcript into the, uh, with it when it comes into infect or reinfect hepatocytes. And so um, hepatitis B X is such a critical component for hepatitis B to take over, uh, over the hepatocyte it sort of makes common sense that the virus would do something like that. There's str a strong evolutionary advantage in doing that. 
Now, the first proof of concept, and that's what I'll try and do, is give each target a certain amount of comment and then um, lead with the proof of concept. It was when, uh, very early on in the um, McClude XB studies, they sh the uh, investigators showed that um, the use of McClude XB in chronic hepatitis B did result in a significant reduction in HPV DNA. So that indeed McCludex was able to protect hepatocytes from, um, in, from reinfection and infection. Um, they were unable to sort of show any benefit significantly with surface antigen, but this is probably, probably because of the fact as we discussed a lot today, that surface antigen in, in these particular patients was probably coming only from integrated transcripts. What about in the concept of the transcripto? Hepatitis B virus, even though it's a, one of the simpler double-stranded DNA genomic viruses, it's a circle. And because it's a circular gen genome, the, 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 uh, there are a lot of sort of natural restrictions that, as well as opportunities that that gives to the virus in terms of replication. And what I've tried to show for you here is that um, even though it is a circle, it's really uh, been able to <coughs> effectively uh, generate a, a large amount of diversity by uh, uh, the frame shifted overlapping reading frames. Every uh, nucleotide is read at least um, three or four, uh, several times, and uh, and regulatory regions also are included as structural components. So that the molecular variants are generated not only because it's a reverse transcriptase um, uh, uh, DNA polymerase, but also because of ApoBec3. Uh, the virus recombines very readily. There are at least seven or eight regions of recombination that we've identified, been, been identified. And what I'll finish my presentation with is the, a little bit of a discussion on the splice variants. So straight up you can see, and I don't have the pointer with me here, but I'll, I'll, if you look at the genome in that uh, right-hand side of the picture, you can see the, I've also drawn for you uh, the RNA, um, major RNA species, and you can see that they all uh, are co-terminal, finishing up with poly A at the, uh, at the three prime end. And um, the X region is really where uh, a lot of regulatory elements are found. And these were discussed a little bit with the um, uh, Arrowhead data this morning in terms of what happens with integration. And it's the uh, DR1, DR2 regions that are really the hotspots for preferred integration. So the, uh, the, 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 if you like, the Achilles heel for the transcriptome of HPV is that if you choose to target carefully, not only will you knock out one particular strand, but you can knock out all four. And so that, and that's what uh, exactly uh, we're able to do with RNAi uh, strategies. This sort of shows you basically the principles of the RNA interference strategy where short synthetic double-stranded RNA molecules are processed through DICER uh, and then with strand separation in the risk complex, um, you get complementary pairing with the target RNA. Uh, cleavage and processing, and then uh, disintegration of the transcript of interest. So uh, I, I won't take um, Bruce's thunder, and uh, but some of the recent data that I've been able to get glean out from what will be presented uh, as a late breaker in a few in a few days' time <coughs> is the the new platform that the Arrowhead have developed, the, the HPV Arrow. This just shows the surface antigen decline that was part of their. Uh, um, uh, part of the abstract that's in the uh, AASLD booklet. So it's, it's, this is in the public domain and the, and the new material will be presented during the meeting. And you can see that this is a really very dramatic um, representation uh, from 100 milligrams, um, th uh, three monthly injections, 200, 300, 400 milligrams. Um, what, what a pretty nice effect the RNAi can have in terms of actually reducing S antigen. So the uh, so individual patients uh, got down to as much as three and a half to four logs, but you can see there that the, the red with the black, with the, the red with the red squares, 100 milligrams uh, dose, was actually quite um, a, a good dose and was able to achieve the most dramatic uh, two log reduction. And I'm sure we'll hear more about that today. But that, I think in terms of um, potent antiviral activity, this is uh, as good as it gets certainly uh, in terms of uh, hepatitis B surface antigen. Uh, one of the, the points that was discussed in, by the immunologist, will this result in restoration of the immune response? Uh, that's obviously uh, something that uh, is going to be very significantly um, and closely monitored. The, the other uh, third part that I wanted to discuss in terms of where we're at today is, is the core protein. The core protein is a, um, obviously for any virus, the nuclear capsule is pretty important for how it gets together and gets um, assembled and, and, and gets out 
out and about. And the, what's shown on this slide is the, is the role of the core protein in the life cycle of HPV, and it, sort of like a gatekeeper, if you like, for the virus. It's sort of, in terms of initial infection through number one shown for you there, um, how it can affect uncoding and transport to the nucleus, where genomic DNA is converted into CCC DNA. Uh, in a collaboration with Thomas Bock, our group showed that the core protein was a critical part of the viral mini chromosome. So it obviously has probably more than a stabilisation effect. It actually did increase the linking number of the mini chromosome, <clears throat> which implied a, uh, a more a transcriptionally regulatory role. Then obviously it's critical in terms of encapsidation and reverse transcription. I mean, the viruses will not actually um, perform reverse transcription in the absence of a nuclear capsid, unlike other retroviruses which can actually do that independently of a capsid. Hepatitis B virus is fundamentally dependent on uh, its, uh, its, um, the, the nuclear capsid to, in which the reverse transcription process results in the generation of a genomic DNA. Now, shown on the slide is that sort of intercellular conversion pathway through pathway six, but as I pointed out, that's probably not an important pathway as we thought a few years ago. So how have the uh, studies gone in terms of um, uh, the, the CPAMs or the, or the or the, or the core active um, molecules, how have they got in terms of inhibiting HPV DNA and RNA? And uh, this was the Novara data. Uh, we're going to see a lot more data at this meeting coming up at the AASLD, but you can see there that um, a typical CPAM is gen generating one to two logs of uh, HPV DNA reduction on the left-hand side of the graph. Um, I think Novira really drew attention to the the interest with HPV RNA in measuring in, in serum, and they're able to show a one log reduction in RNA, and they're able to show a combination with um, uh, pegylated interferon. At least it was additive in terms of that respect. So certainly these drugs are active. Uh, they're able to show a good efficacy. Uh, they can be in combination with um, pegylated interferon. And what will be interesting is that uh, looking at the abstracts, we're seeing more and more examples of the CPAMs, uh, to me they're sort of striking in terms of their getting down into, uh, they're reducing the dose from doses like 600 milligrams twice a day, that's 1.2 grams of drug a day, that's just too much and, uh, but for a, a long period of time because these are not going to be drugs that will just be used for 12 to 18 weeks, they're going to be used for at least 24 to 50 to 48. So <clears throat> I think one of the drivers of the CPAM will have to be potency and to reduce the dose and also try and work out why they're not having much of an effect on hepatitis B surface antigen. So um, the last part of my talk, I just try and say from a virological perspective where um, this in incredible sort of uh, emergence of interest in hepatitis B has resulted in a whole lots of new insights. And, and that's one of the nice things about um, cure, cure themes and cure approaches is that you're, you're, you know, you think you knew something about hepatitis B virus until along came the pharmaceutical industry. So, so I think what I'd like to point out is um, some of the sort of lessons that I've learned in the last year or, or two about uh, hepatitis B. So one of the highlights was uh, working with Arrowhead and, and, and Arrowhead sort of resolving the issue about the E antigen positive versus the E antigen negative strains and, and the role of integration, how, how important that is in terms of the life cycle of HPV. And so that's actually resulted in a whole new uh, sphere of, in, of interest in the uh, significance and the mechanism of integration. We've learned so much about the chromatinization and the role of hepatitis BX in interacting with um, the uh, structural maintenance chromosomes 5 and 6 and its epigenetic regulation of the mini chromosome. Um, who would have thought that RNA splicing was regarded as a sort of uh, esoteric area in hepatitis B, but has now emerged as really a critical part of understanding the life cycle of HPV. And, and <clears throat> the study of occult hepatitis B, how that's actually reframed how we can actually think in terms of cure strategies. Uh, we already knew a fair bit about the packaging reaction and the reverse transcription, uh, and uh, we're grateful for the, the Mercludex studies which have taught us about entry and re-entry. So um, I, I quick, we don't need to go linger through this. These have already been covered by uh, many immunologists, which I'm pleased to see that the immunologists are getting interested in virology. But um, it's, it's a scary thought, but uh, I can cope, I think. <laughs> um, so what, what, what this slide is just sort of trying to capture is that 
when we talk about the mini chromosome, the mini chromosome is a very heterogeneous structure. It, it, it exists of at least 21 different topo <coughs> isomers. So it's not a single entity. And I think one of the messages that the virologists need to convey to people is that a CCC DNA, which is a, a bad term, really means 21 topo isomers in the context of hepatitis B. And uh, fully chromatinized uh, mini chromosomes are transcriptionally silent. And the way X regulates that is really, really interesting. And, uh, and definitely reflects differences in transcriptional activities. Uh, this is a seminal work by collaboration with uh, um, the a Swiss group of uh, Jean-Michel Strubens and, um, and Gilead, defining the role of hepatitis B X with the uh, SMC56 or the um, ND10. And I think that really taught me about the important role of chromatinization in DNA viruses generally. <coughs> And, and how the host cell responds and sort of uh, reacts to invading, HP, invading DNA molecules generally. So um, the role of hepatitis B X in terms of uh, a minus variant or um, variants generally, how that regulates uh, um, the mini chromosome itself. Um, we've sort of covered a lot of this. So uh, addressing the HPV DNA integration issue, it's good to see that labs like the Urban Lab are now getting uh, active research programs, uh, really teaching us that integration occurs very early when infection is first established. This was in a paper published just this year from Thomas Tu and Urban from the Journal of Virology. Um, and then we've learnt that integration is an important source of service antigen. Uh, the, the precursor mechanism is through the double-stranded linear. Um, and uh, Mason's taught us about the role in clonal expansion of the so-called resistant hepatocytes. We haven't talked about that, those sort of nodules being a that does that give the host cell an advantage having these sorts of uh, multiple D HPV DNA integrants in terms of actually uh, a, a, an advantage in terms of being resistant to the host immune response trying to get rid of them. So that, that's what actually drives the actual nodular proliferation of those particular uh, structures. Um, there are now PCR assays available for double-stranded linear DNA, which I think is very important. And um, Arrowhead have taught us that uh, we can actually successfully target these integrated transcripts through molecular-based therapeutics. So it's, it's not, even though it's challenging to, on one hand, it's also therapeutically possible on another. Um, I won't go through the splicing because of the pressures of time, outside of saying that um, at least 10% of the DNA populations in any individual contain spliced genomes. And that's actually a significant investment of the virus in terms of uh, alternative um, molecular structures. And that 80% of patients actually have spliced variants. So this, this is not, a, as I said, an esoteric activity, and it's probably important in terms of, tra of certainly a transformation. And so this is from Jean-Pierre Alain, um, the blood banker, but um, he's a blood banker getting into virology. And so um, I don't have a pointer, but you can see the major pathways there of unspliced RNA, uh, pre-genomic -pre and the messenger RNA, and then you superimpose upon that in the same cell. The, the splicing mechanism where spliced pregenomic RNA is actually chopped up and formed into uh, the major transcripts and it generates at least three neoproteins and also S variants. Uh, the the um, S messenger RNA can be sort of spliced as well. So there are multiple structures to be discovered uh, as well as uh, existing variants that have been identified. And to date, at least 25 spliced variants have been identified and I'm sure there are more to come. Sorry. So the, uh, the some work that was done by um, uh, by the German group um, Stefan uh, Stefan Gunther that uh, you know some 15 years ago showed that the regulation of HPV the pre-SS mRNA and surface antigen itself is actually regulated by the production of the pre-SS spliced message. So here is a spliced message regulating uh, the wild type variant. Now why that's important is in uh, in uh, understanding occult hepatitis B, um, Jean-Pierre Alain identified the splice site variants around uh, G458A. This is where the major splicing uh, domain for hepatitis B exists. And that in um, cases of uh, occult hepatitis B, <coughs> um, something like 40% of the Asian cases that he studied contain these splice variants. And that this was the, and it was the, uh, the if you like, the lack of splice that actually results in the um, uh, implications for S antigen loss uh, through um, wild type pre S and S. So splicing is actually a, a way in which the virus regulates its normal amount of excess and surface antigen. So when these splice mu when these splice variants are actually lost due to mutation, then this can actually result in uh, S antigen negativity, which is the, the definition 
of occult hepatitis B. That, uh, your S antigen negative, but you have low levels of DNA in the serum and the liver. So the occult hepatitis B story could actually be a very good model for how we actually go forward in trying to achieve our functional cure endpoint. Now, um, we've already covered this. This is the uh, reverse transcription pathway, showing again that it's a, a core and capsid independent. And it leads us into this sort of bridge between the direct acting antiviral agents and the um, in, innate uh, activators that we discussed before our break. And this was, um, uh, I've had the pleasure of working with um, the Springbank Group and uh, Ina Rigavir and with uh, Hightower Guo from Iowa. And in, in this collaboration, we've basically worked out that uh, uh, certainly the direct acting antiviral part of uh, Ina Rigavir is by certainly interacting with the five prime end of the HPV pregenomic RNA and that this interaction results in um, packaging but does not allow either priming or priming translocation to follow. So here is an, a, a very nice example of where this might still be a rig eye agonist, but it also is a direct acting antiviral agent working at the level of, um, uh, of reverse transcription, but it's independent of, um, a, of a nuke behavior. Uh, and just to sort of show that, that, was, uh, that came about because of the observation that in Arigavir, uh, had a potent effect in, in, uh, on HPV DNA and HPV RNA in E antigen negative patients and that was unexpected, and so that was very interesting. So my last slide is really targeting. We ha haven't really <coughs> talked very much about uh, particular targeting strategies. Um, we've obviously got RNA interference. We ha there's been very little discussion about anti-HPS antibodies, but really I'll just finish up with one of my favorite slides, which is um, I give to all my fellows, and uh, to understand the surface antigen, you need to understand the A determinant. And uh, there is no other protein on Earth that has eight prolines and eight cysteines in the space of 40 amino acids. And so the structural variability and uh, opportunities for the virus to trick the um, cell biology, both the innate immune response and uh, adaptive response, is enormous. Thank you very much.